my pleasure today to welcome Hayden Rees um, into the Fifth Direction community for a conversation. Um, many of you out there might know um, Hayden's work as a, as a filmmaker, um, having potentially watched Rumi, Poet of the Heart, or A Thousand Years of Joy about Robert Bly, or perhaps even um, the work on, on William Stafford, who's a poet that we all, all admire in, in this community. Um, but I, I got connected to Hayden um, a few years ago, um, just after the death of Robert Bly, when I was asked by the friends of William Stafford to write a piece on their relationship, on the relationship between Robert Bly and William Stafford. And um, given Hayden had already made a film about this, a wonderful film called A Literary Friendship, um, I, I made it my mission to reach out to, to Hayden um, and have a conversation. So since then, you've been on my mind. Um, and uh, just thinking about an opportunity to um, to have a conversation with you and and then having seen you revamp all your work and, and place it in a different kind of vehicle um, for offering, um, there you were again. So I thought it was pretty timely to reach out and say hi. So with that long-winded introduction, Hayden, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much, Asher. Yeah, and I, I always begin by maybe asking you uh, where you're physically located just so people listening can maybe orientate themselves i'm in a small town carlsbad california it's at the northern corner of san diego county in california usa if i squint i could see the ocean it's about a mile away and uh that's where i am well that's a beautiful part of the world and, and i guess the other side of that question hayden is what are you doing there? What's what's alive for you right now? Uh, what what are you creating? Um, what's in your heart? Well, in my heart, <laughs> oh man, uh, these are those are big questions. The, uh, I think I'm in my heart. I'm trying to uh, find uh, a, a new sense of um, faith, a new sense of confidence. The ability to have more kindness towards others. The last few years I've been really rattled. Uh, life has thrown me some big curves and um, I'm sort of climbing out of that. And uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, there's, there's, I'm sure there's a lot there to unpack, but we appreciate you being yeah. here anyway. Yeah, no, this is a, this is a treat. It's always a treat to uh, hopefully be in the community of like-minded beings and I mean, I feel we're all sharing similar travails and hopefully some similar joys and, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Interesting. Well, yeah, that's, that's for sure. Well, let, let, let's, um, I'm, I'm going to take you back, Hayden. I, I wanted to ask you um, really a question about when filmmaking came into your life and when that kind of became the direction, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I you know, I was kind of a loose cannon for, a number of years and then I found myself in Los Angeles and um, like every third person in LA you drift into the entertainment business of some kind and a friend of mine had a, a feature film set up at Paramount and he needed a uh, assistant and um, I was just rambling and so he took me in and um, he had another film set up called Jacob's Ladder and uh, so he had two films in going to production and the director for uh, Jacob's Ladder was Adrian Lyne from England. He did Fatal Attraction, nine and a half weeks. And, um, you know, he was a big, big guy at the time. And he came in and he needed an assistant. And he liked me. And he said, why don't you come work for me? And I, and I was allowed to go. And so that's how I got into, say, films, the big time deal. And then I worked on another feature film after that. But then I realized I wasn't really Hollywood material in the sense of you either become like an agent or somebody who's developing projects. And it was at this time in Los Angeles where I was living, uh, Bly was in circulation with uh, James Hillman and Michael Mead, you know, the three, the three wise men. And uh, they had just gotten a big write up in the LA Weekly by Michael Ventura. And, you know, it just intrigued me. There was just, I don't know what was in it, but something said, you know, go check it out. So I wound up going to a, uh, a men's retreat, maybe two, 250 men or so up in a, you know, a Boy Scout camp a few hours from LA. And that was a type of baptism, you know? I mean, 
I felt very um, immediately kind of like I belong here. I, I feel the, this, the emphasis on father son work, uh, the extreme gifts of, you know, Hillman, Mead and Bly, especially Robert. I mean, you know, so that's how um, I got to, to Bly and that. And then a few years later, I said, I got to get out of LA. I worked on another feature, but, and um, said, what could I do? I said, well, the only thing you really are interested in is what this, you know, what Robert's up to in this men's stuff. And I went up to Robert and again, I've never made a film. This is back in a primitive day. We're all spoiled today with the gear and equipment and phones. And, but back then it, it wasn't as easy as it looks now. And I said, oh, I want to make a documentary. Firstly, I had to get the nerve up to go up to him because, you know, he was at that time very godlike to me, you know, and he big and this and that. And, and I went up to Robert and said, Robert, um, I'd like to make a, 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 a documentary about you and maybe some other poets. And I go, wow, do you have any money? And I said, uh, I got a little money. And he said, how much do you have? Like he was really testing me out. And I said, uh, I got, and I didn't know what it was going to cost. So I said, $20,000. So, okay. And then he got back to me. He said, the only person I would be interested in doing something with is William Stafford. So Stafford was like his older brother in a sense, you know, we all looked up to Bly, but Bly had a, you know, uh, Stafford was about eight, nine years older than him. And I had seen them read together at a men's gathering too, uh, around this time. And they sat side by side and they just traded poems back and forth, you know, and they were, and they're just, their friendship, the poetry, you know, like two, you know, great jazz musicians trading riffs. And I, you know, I, I distinctly remember, and I was in my, uh, probably my mid thirties. I distinctly remember if I'm gonna become an old guy, I wanna be like them. And um, so then, you know, Robert, I said, okay, we'll do it about you and, and, and Bill Stafford. Mm. And that's how I started. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So um, um, the, the literary friendship came first that documentary came that was the first yeah. thing out of the that yeah. kind of relationship yeah and robert gave it the title i could still see i went to show him like a rough cut of it and i had some other kind of crazy i think my working title for it was uh, robert bly and william stafford a story that could be true which is the name of a of a of a stafford poem right and i don't know robert well how about a literary friendship because that was okay with me, hmm. but um, it's and and so over the next you know year and a half, I uh, did film up in uh, Oregon where Stafford lives, and then went up to Minneapolis when Stafford was going to visit Robert out there and in shot, and um, and this was for all you filmmakers out there, which we all are now. Every third person is a filmmaker, but. Um, Nonlinear editing had an, does, didn't exist. If you could, if you follow this, so you, you take a VHS tape of your material, and you take a piece, and then you find the next piece you want, and you edit it next to it, and then you go along. But then you'd realize you'd want to put something between it, and you had to start again from the beginning because you just couldn't drop it in. I say that because it, it, it's unbelievable that how that's how it used to be. It was so. Um, hands-on like that and time consuming and all that. Um, finished it in, I was on a deadline to finish it because uh, Bill was turning 80 or 79 and uh, in January and it was August. And I said, I gotta get this done for that event. And um, we were pretty close when we uh, got a call um, that Bill had had this uh, heart attack and, and had died. And, and we were still editing. And I had been staring at, you know, his picture for months. And now he was gone, you know? And uh, so there was that. Mm. So we went up, we still went up. They still had a birthday celebration. Only this time it was, I mean, it was very moving. You know, the fa Bly's family there, the Stafford's place was sold out. I mean, you know theater and you know everybody because bill was so deeply loved 
And um, so it was at this theater in, in, um, in Portland and I'm nervous and I've flown up with my uh, editor and she's with me and it, you know, I've never made anything before. I can't tell you if it's good or not. You know, I mean, all I know. And now I felt the burden of, oh my God, the grieving family. And you know, what, what I have to offer them. And so I was, you know, I'm an insecure type. I, I got a lot of Kafka in me. I'm always expecting to be found guilty. And, and uh, so we're sitting there in the dark in the front row, me and her, and uh, the thing starts and uh, the screen up comes this uh, Viking galley ship on the water, the guys. And they're dubbed. It's like one of those old Italian muscle gladiator things. And, they, and my mind goes, oh my God, they've put up the wrong film. The grieving family is, you know, and, it was, and then it turned out that it was the promo for their local film festival. But I, I never forgot that because I, for a minute, wanted to jump up and said, I'm sorry, this is not the film. This is not the film. And anyway, it was a huge, it was very, very well received. People were, you know, it, it went very well. It was a beautiful night. Got a lot of love. Was Bly there that night? Or? Oh yeah, Bly and his wife and Dorothy Stafford, who mm. I became very close with, Kim Stafford, who I'm still friends with, the sisters, and and again, Stafford, you know, had been teaching at Lewis and Clark College for decades. He was a much loved. He was the, you know, he was a Oregon poet laureate, and he didn't seem like he was just going to leave us that fast. You know, he didn't have a declining health. It just, in fact, there's a poem, and I don't know it that um, is the last poem he wrote, which if, I, think, I think it's called, Is That You, Mr. Stafford? And it's about getting, you know the poem? He got, okay. he got a call I and it's the wrong Stafford. They're looking for somebody else. And he just builds on that. But it's very interesting to read it in the context of that it's his last poem because there is a sense of a finality to what he's trying to say. So that, you know, that's how I got going. Wow, that there's so much in there. I'm almost um, unsure where to go next. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that um, I'd love to know about how your relationship kind of deepened with these people as, as you worked with them. Like, I'm not sure. Uh, it sounds to me like you had kind of a glancing relationship with with Robert, and and maybe the same with with Bill. But then, obviously, over the course of doing the movie with them, doing the film with them, you would have everything would have changed. The, the depth of the relationship and the trust and I'd just love you to talk about that kind of part of the journey about getting to know these characters and, and becoming, you know, almost um, into the inner sanctum, I guess. You know, at the time, I did not feel uh, as, as uh, savvy and confident as I may seem now. I, I felt like I was over my head, that I had been led into the party without getting my, you know, my driver's license, you know, I, I, but my, I was very sincere. And also I'm not, you know, I'm going after something that not a lot of people are, were interested in following, you know, so I had that going for me. I worked with some good, you know, my little team, I got, you know, production people were, were good. And I always had good instincts, I guess, but, um, you know, those, those, those are people with very big brains. And um, and so, you know, if I would say to a young filmmaker, when you go in, you know, there's, there's somebody or something that you're drawn to, you want to do something about them. So that passion will, will carry you a certain way. Ideally, though, you have um, some sense of direction, what within the person you'd like to find out about. You know, you want to find out about their relationship with their father or how they, you know, kept writing when you, they, you know, whatever it is. And I just, I was just happy to be in their presence, but I didn't really feel like I certainly no, I didn't feel like an equal. I wasn't, and again, I had no, I had nothing behind me to point to, right? Now, by the time I got to the last film with Robert, I, you know, I at least knew the mechanics of it, uh, but still, you know, the hope is to try to get something mm, special. And um, I always say, you know, if you pick a good cast, 
you know? If you look at my films, I say, look who's in them. I mean, I had Robert Bly and William Stafford. You know, I'm halfway home. <laughs> you know, like, I could screw it up, but I'm starting with pretty good ingredients. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 oh, it certainly does. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, Bly for, for all his, his, his gruffness. Like he had this, you know, so many people talk about his um, ability to kind of give people a platform to express themselves creatively and let what's inside them, you know, truly come out. And it feels to me as a young, unknown filmmaker with nothing backing you that he just said, you know, here's, here's your chance. Absolutely. In fact, I, I mean, I made it on a shoestring. I don't know where we got the, you know, I, I do know where we got the money. We, not much. And, um, and I was, I was coming up short in, in post-production and I, I don't know if I asked Robert or he just offered and, you know, Robert was making money at those days, Iron John and all that. And he sent me a check and that was very sweet. And I tell you for the next two or three years after that, when he would come through the Bay Area to do readings, whatever, and I'd always go to see him. I mean, his live act, I mean, forget, you know, it's like the greatest rock and roll you can go see is see Robert live when he was in his heyday and with musicians. And he always came over to me and gave me a special hug or acknowledgement because he loved William so much. And he, you know, he was, you know, he had just finished doing a book of, um, Stafford's selected poems. So the ch putting them together, making them come together for the purposes of the film turned out to be a gift to Robert, you know, because he got to spend time with him and he always well, appreciated that. Yeah, and particularly as, you know, William's death came um, at yeah. that moment, it just seems incredibly profound. It, it really was. I mean, I could still see the editing room when I got the call and I turned to Yvette, who was the editor, I said, you're not gonna believe it, Bill died. What? Um, again, we've been for months hustling to get this thing done. And I'm saying this, this sounds almost contrived, but I swear it isn't. Within a couple of days, in my change, <laughs> I'm not a mystical guy anymore, but I'll say this, in my change, there was a buffalo nickel. Now, you know what a buffalo nickel is there in Australia? Uh, you uh, let, d Describe it for us. Well, before we had, we have Thomas Jefferson, the president on our nickels. But before 1936 was a profile of a Native American man. And he was, you know, he was taken from an actual portrait of a guy and, and back had a buffalo. And it was referred to as Buffalo Nickel, very beautiful coin, but haven't been in circulation since the, you know, the late thirties. And it's how one got into common, you know, but Bill had a little uh, native blood in him. And so I just took it as, Again, you know, when you want to believe, you're looking for a connection. So I thought it was just a little sign. But again, these are the little, little things that stand out, you know, that I remember. Yeah, I'm, I'm tying it all the way back to, you know, Bly first um, asking you about, you know, how much money have you got to back this? And there's almost like a connection all the way through to receiving that coin. There's like a through line. Yeah, that's good. I, and, you know, a lot of us who like the arts, I mean, and I was definitely guilty of this, didn't want to think about the monetary side of things. You know, give it to somebody else, say, but no, that's, that's, um, that's being disrespectful to part of, um, you know, part of the requirements and, and, and this. And, you know, why should Bly uh, say yes to a guy who's got, you know, 15 bucks in his pocket? I mean, you know, he needed to set, a barrier high enough to see if you're, you know, you got to get tested a little bit, right? Yeah, no, I, I like that a lot. And, um, you know, I'm also thinking about that night of the, um, of the, of the first screening there. And, um, you know, when, when I listen to Bly's voice, like in, in, in the times after Bill died, like you can just see how, how, how much it impacted his life. You know, there's, uh, it's, it's actually quite, disarming um to listen to him speaking about bill when, when he was on stage shortly afterwards and i'm wondering like could, could you could you feel that sort of viscerally in in the room with robert and others that that night yeah i mean i don't know if it's i can't remember if it's in the film but it was definitely in the interviews where um robert says that uh robert was a younger brother 
He had an older brother. And Bill was an older brother and had a younger brother. And Robert's, uh, uh, and Robert's brother died in 1970. He, he stayed on the farm, but um, so he had that loss. And, um, but my point is that Robert, who everybody looked up to, saw in Bill the older father not, or older brother, though probably there's some father in there because Robert had such a troubled relationship with his own father. But Bill embodied a type of, you know, calm generosity, um, patience. And, you know, they didn't seem like they would be best of friends because, you know, Robert was flamboyant and big. And, you know, uh, Stafford was kind of quiet and, you know, low key. But they, you know, that was part of what made them, you know, so interesting, right? But they had this great affection and overlap. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it is in in the film where Blass says um, something, I'm paraphrasing, if he says something like, um, I, he says, um, Bill whispers at those who are awake and I yell at those who are asleep or so, something similar, which I, I which I absolutely loved. And, and mm -hmm. that's all you needed to say about the difference between them. It said everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and it's funny, from a literary friendship at some point, I mean, I had seen Coleman Barks give readings. I, you know, we all learned about Rumi through the men's work because Robert was sharing his own translations, but also, you know, Coleman's. And uh, I'm going to attempt my Coleman Barks in imitation. At one point, a few years later, I said, Haddon, why don't you do a film about Rumi? Haddon. You know, he's from Georgia. Um, and uh, I, I said, well, you know, maybe. And that's how I got onto. So Coleman sort of gave me the blessings to proceed. He had maybe just done the big Bill Moyers interview, which sort of put him on the map. You know, Rumi was, I, Rumi, now that film is 25 years old. And Rumi uh, was just starting to take off in terms of widespread awareness and the bill moyers interview with coleman certainly did that help that go um but i really think rumi of poet of the heart which had two or three runs on pbs which is our public uh, broadcasting system here just caught that wave and um and so one thing led to the other and that was about three or four years later and as we were speaking earlier i was uh in a serious relationship and not knowing how to proceed. And I started the Rumi film and quickly found out that there were a whole lot of different people who claimed that they knew really what Rumi was all about. There was a lot of competition within that whole Sufi mystical world of who's got the true understanding, who's got the true teaching. And I talked to a handful of people and I said, oh my God, this is a this isn't what I thought I was getting into, you know, because I didn't want to get into some, you know, theological um, hair splitting. And uh, I probably worked on the film for about a year and then I paused it because I couldn't resolve, like, what, what do you do? Because, again, there's no surprise, you know, competition within... Um, I once said to Coleman, I said, you know, the Persians claim Rumi because he was in what was then greater Persia. And the Turks, Turkish people claim him because he was in Konya all those years. And Coleman said, yeah, well, everybody's gonna claim a genius. And, um, and then it was leading up to my decision about getting married, which I went through with. And then in the, in the uh, midst of that, I said, you know, the one thing I know about Rumi, forget what everybody else knows, that Rumi seems to be asserting this sense of a, uh, a presence of love, you know, inextingu inextinguishable presence of love. That, and I said, you know, maybe that's what the film should hover around. Yeah. And um, so I used that as sort of my guide rather than going into all, all the sidebars that were possible with that. Yeah, that's so that, that's uh, strong. That's strong. I can really feel that. Um, 
there's that moment in the film when Coleman recites Rumi and he says, um, you know, whatever was said to the rose to make it, you know, open was, was said to me in the center of my chest. And there's this idea of, um, to me that, um, it's just such a wonderfully deep kind of expression to understand love. I, I don't know how that hit you when you heard him say that in, in, in when you were talking to him, but wow, it, it really, it hit me in the center of the chest. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a long time ago for me. I, I, you know, we'd have, I'd have, you know, it's hard to remember our younger selves clearly. Right. Mm. But, you know, but I know that that was how I felt then and um, like I said, we were speaking before, you know, I had a I had a pretty long marriage, but it it did it, it ended. Should I should I've been reading more Rumi to her? Mm. You know, so, have, I, have I loved you well enough today? Is the, yeah. is the is the expression that comes to mind? Yeah, uh, well, that's the you know the famous one that everybody knows. You know, out out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to even say the word each other. And, you know, wrongdoing and right, that's us, right? We, 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 we're wrong sometimes, we're right sometimes, but it's all, you know, put into this place where it's all, all included. So, yeah, that was, that was a good one. That was, that was, um, uh, a lot of pleasure in, in the making of that. Where where does that? I'm just trying to fit fit it in, kind of cr chronologically. So did 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 the Stafford film, the one that stands alone, um, you know, every war has two losers. Did that come about? Come after <laughs> they came after Rumi. Okay. Oh, okay. So you kind of returned, yeah, to to to, to the original ground, if you if if you will. Yeah, that came about because that was in 2008, I think. Um, the Iraq war was going pretty strong. And um, of course, you know, Stafford, as a lot of people know, was a conscientious objector. Second World War, wrote a beautiful book called Down in My Heart about his time in the camps. Um, uh, and the, I don't know, at the time, it just seemed uh, very troubling. Uh, the whole way the Iraq war got underway and um, my kids were very young at the time and so I think I was thinking about them and uh, I so I started to read um, there's a book called Every War Has Two Losers which is his son Kim took uh, clips from his diaries, from Bill's diaries, just pulled lines from the diaries and and put them all together in one book. And they all, you know, they all center around what is the right thing to do? When is this called for and when is it not? And um, I don't know, it just felt like I wanted to do something. I wanted to try something and I, and I actually, and I wanted to try to do something a little more ambitious in terms of the production. I don't think I was really that successful, to be honest, but, you know, I made an effort. Um, again, I was working right before the, the explosion in the ability to have special effects and to have affordable special effects. And all, all the bells and whistles came a little too late for that film because I wanted bells and whistles. I wanted a little, um, but there's some, and and I did my so you know Robert Bly was in the Navy, uh, but he didn't he didn't go overseas, and uh, I think it's in it's in the film where he you know actually says you know I think Bill was right show me a good war and uh, but show me a, is it a good war you know that there's a statement I can't uh, remember it by heart but you know Bill says you know I you know if it's the right thing to do to fight I'll fight but first what is the right thing to do. So there's something there. Yeah, no, I, I loved all those connecting uh, pieces there. And, and you can see the evolution. Now I understand that more of the chronology, you can see the evolution. Um, so I think that adds a nice piece, at least for me personally, um, a, a different lens to kind of see, see, see all this through, you know? Um, and then I'm guessing now, just while we're here, sort of talking about the um, completeness, then there's the, 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 the Walt Whitman 
um, short film you did as well, which is like, was that the most recent? Yes, that was done. I just, in 2019, uh, Whitman had his 200th uh, anniversary, and I just thought, surely I can, you know, get a few dollars to make something. And um, so I went to this big foundation that does poetry, and, you know, they knew me a bit. And I said, hey, I'm, I'll make something really sweet. Uh, and it'll be, we could you know, circulate it during the Whitman. So that's how that got done. Yeah. Uh, mm. But that came after um, A Thousand Years of Joy, which was sort of my, you know, that was the culmination of the, of the Bly films, right? And, um, you know, I think really, you know, it's my best work in the sense of I had learned a lot of different things and it was the challenge of trying to get this big story about this big life in there get most of it in and keep it on track um and also because when i started the film you know bly was already in his 80s and he wasn't on the road uh so i know the days of people getting to see him live were over and for us who were you know lucky enough to see him in person you know it was great i mean he was just fantastic performer in a sense right so you know, something for those who will not get to see that, but but get a taste of him. And my hope, since I focused on these writers, is always that it'll lead the person to want to get the books, want to do their own reading. Mm. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that have it's had that impact on for sure. I mean, yeah. for us too, um, there's um, obviously uh, uh, being Australian and, and, and growing up in Australia, there's, you know, that's all happening on the other side of the world, you know? So um, I think to actually bring it into, into our, you know, looking at the images and seeing, seeing the, the words spoken and, and having it all wrapped up in a beautiful little gift like that um, for us uh, over here on the other side of the planet, there's, there's a certain extra impact that that has, I guess. Mm. I think Robert came to Australia several times to see John Stokes, who is a tracker. I know. No, I don't know anything about that, but I knew that. Yeah, well, I know John's work, and in fact, interestingly enough, that was introduced to me via um, the Minnesota Men's Conference. So I learned a little bit about um, oh, good, good. about a man from my own uh, yeah, yeah. soil, but uh, via that channel. So that was kind of interesting to kind of loop, yeah. loop back on itself in a way. But also, Robert, you know, he spoke a lot about um, um, Australian Indigenous um, culture. Um, so he's obviously reasonably well versed, and I imagine most of that would have come through John potentially yeah he i mean i guess particularly in anything mythological i had you know because he was friends with campbell and joseph campbell and um you know he had a he was a um one of his um uh who went to harvard with him uh was a poet named donald hall who had a big career as a poet afterwards but donald hall said when they met as freshmen at harvard they said you know said you know everybody here is bright, but Robert is really bright. <laughs> you know, he really, I mean, he was, he did have a very sharp brain, very large capacity and, and very curious and. Um, mm. Mm. So did you have any, I'm looping all the way back now. Um, yeah. That's okay. Did you, um, you know, prior to that first weekend away um, with the men, with, with Hillman and me, with, with, did you have any kind of, um, you know, I guess, um, soulful leanings or, or poetic um, understanding or, you know, were you into anything at all? Was it, we, did you just go into that completely raw? I grew up in New York City. Yeah. And uh, um, I, 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 I hate saying it, but I, I would have to say that I was a hippie. I mean, I look at, well, you had the hair down to here. You'd walk on those uh, city pavements barefoot, much to the unhappiness of my my parents, who you know just thought that oh, it's so dirty and whatever. And I did some of those, you know, those hippie things. And um, one of the hippie things of the day was uh, mysticism. And New York at the time, in the in the sixties and seventies, seventies, I'm thinking probably was when all this for me. Um, all these gurus were coming th from India through New York, Muktananda, Satchidananda, um, 
I mean, you know, and they'd do talks and we used to go and it was a wonderful, you know, like, so, uh, you know, I just would, uh, I don't know if that connects to your question, but um, poetry, uh, I didn't really hear poetry until really with, with the uh, men's work and, and Robert. But I think I was primed for uh, some sort of salvation because I my my early life was was kind of you know all over the place and, and at times directionless and and I lost my father very young and you know so probably the father son dynamic that the men's work and and Robert and I mean again Robert the, the first weekend I went to was all men right and and I went to a number of those so the father son thing you know is is huge and so um yeah yeah no i'm feeling that um you know it sounds to me like you came back from that weekend and everything changed i remember i don't know if it was at one of those weekends so what would happen it'd be a break right the, the men would do their thing on stage it'd be a little break you'd go outside and of course, wherever Robert went, or Hillman or Michael, but where Robert went, a little, you know, we'd all kind of gather around, just try to listen. You don't need to, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I remember getting to Robert once, and I was just feeling so much, uh, you know, love in the air from all the men in the back and forth. And I said, Robert, I said, you know, a lot of us look to you like a father figure. And he said, oh, that's good, you know. I could, I could deal with it. I could, he, I, I, it was something along those lines, but he said, that's good. I got it. I go ahead. Meaning he was willing to take on, I don't know. I hate talk like projection. It was projection, but he was representing a positive image of the older man that we all think we're headed towards, but we're very unsure if we're going to get there. You know, I mean, his thing about blessing, Young men need to be blessed by the older men. And that's what was going on there. Mm. And, you know, um, it saddens me a bit because I don't know what's going on for the young men today. You know, there's, may there be things going on like that. I just don't know. I have an 18-year-old boy. And, mm. um, yeah. Has he shown any interest in... Because I know you still sort of show up at the Minnesota Men's Conference from time to time, and 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 you're still kind of there. Um, uh, 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 is he? He's not in that kind of headspace. And no, he, no. Yeah, no. He's he's somewhere so else you know, right now. Somewhere else, and uh, you you can't force. I mean, because it won't work. Mm. You have to attract. And uh, he and I are going out of town next week for a few days, going up into the mountains. And you know, I'm not gonna. I'm going to tone myself down and hope that just the setting and the this and that will just open something up between us. You know, that's my hope. Mm. I can't demand. Perhaps a, uh, uh, a symbol, perhaps a, a Buffalo nickel might, might arise somewhere out there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, Hayden, while, while we're here, I, I kind of, um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to to talk about um, how you've kind of created this library of your work m more mm. recently, which, you know, feels to me like um, a, a kind of passion play, but also giving people an easier uh, way to kind of mm -hmm. access the material. So, you know, talk to me um, about how that idea came. And I imagine that's been a body of work to get that done. Yeah, I mean, I, I just didn't want my films to be orphans. And and people, you know, would say, who knew about them, hey, where can I see this? Well, they're not up on YouTube because, I mean, going about 20 years, we would, you know, people would buy a DVD, right? And then they think they'd be generous because they want to share it. And then they would upload it to uh, YouTube. And the little filmmaker wasn't going to get a nickel. And they didn't understand that you're giving away somebody else's work. So I dealt with that for many years. I mean, <laughs> the Rumi film has been viewed. It's not up now because finally YouTube helped the little guys. And, you know, if it's copyrighted, 
you could get it taken down and people will say, why don't you want to just give it away? I say, well, you know, because the electric company doesn't want to just give away electricity. I mean, it's, it's making a living. It's an honorable thing. Anyway, all this to say, I didn't want, I wanted them to live somewhere and they're on Vimeo, though if you asked me, ah, and it wasn't prepared, but um, I think in a search bar in Vimeo, um, on poetry, I believe might take you to the page because on poetry films, on poetry films. And that's where the four major films and the Walt Whitman piece are, and they cost a few bucks to stream them for, and you get 72 hours and it's a labor of love. I just don't know the, um, the exact, but on poetry films at Vimeo, maybe I could get that to you and you could, well, we'll, we'll 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 put a link up here underneath yeah. this this video, and it it already, as I said, that those links already exist oh, certainly within our platform on the Fifth Direction. Yeah. But to get it out more broadly, yeah, we'll put some links around the place. Yeah, it's all meant to be food. You know, yeah. it's it's. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, seeing it on a small screen, uh, you know, it's it's better than nothing. Uh, if you could see it on a big screen, obviously, you know, the days of screenings was nice and film festivals when you could uh, bring a, you know, a lot of people into a room and do a screening and get that collective feeling. But listen, it, it, they, they still work. I could say that I looked at them and, and um, yeah, I, I, they, they hold up. Oh, I, I think they absolutely do. Um, like I know many people who have hold those films in in in, in very high regard. And um, yeah. you know, in in the context of food, let me just say, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure, um, it's a pleasure to to sit at sit at your table and to uh, and and to taste of the food which you've prepared so lovingly. It's um, it's it's a beautiful thing. Those are kind words. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well look maybe that's a, a nice place to leave it but it's been an absolute pleasure and um, i look forward to the next conversation um, thank you maybe, asher yeah and potentially inviting you in um to do something with our community in a in, in, a, in, a, in a in a live setting okay love it love it love it mm. thank you brother thank you cheers